as a constitutional law attorney, former senior legal advisor and personal counsel to President Donald J. Trump. Jenna Ellis believes in the rule of law and the importance of integrity in our elections. And she's ready to tackle the big cultural and legal issues facing America. This is The Jenna Ellis Show. Here is your host, Jenna Ellis. With inflation, the banking world collapse, and everything that Joe Biden is doing not to protect America, you need to make sure to secure your financial health, especially in retirement. And hey, if you're a millennial like me, that actually is sooner than you think. You need to start now, even if you are a millennial or a Gen Zer, to make sure that your financial health is actually healthy when we get to retirement. And Legacy Precious Metals has a revolutionary new online platform that allows you to invest in gold and silver online in real time. In a few easy steps, you can open an account online, select your metals of choice, and choose to have them stored in a vault or shipped right to your door. You'll have access to a dashboard where you can track your portfolio growth in real time anytime. You'll see transparent pricing on each coin and bar, and this puts you in complete control of your money. The platform is free to sign up for. Visit LegacyPMInvestments.com and open your account and see this new investing platform for yourself. Gold hedges against inflation and against a volatile stock market. A truly diversified portfolio isn't just more stocks and bonds, but different asset classes. This brand new platform allows you to make investments in gold and silver, no matter how small or large, with just a few clicks. Visit LegacyPM.com to get started. You can download the free investor's guide and you can also call Legacy PM Investments to talk to a portfolio expert to get expert answers to your uh, to customize your personal portfolio. So visit LegacyPMInvestments.com to get started. Tell them that Jenna sent you. Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of The Jenna Ellis Show. I'm Jenna Ellis, and you've probably been reading the reports, uh, even as recently as today, about California and these rolling blackouts and saying, you know, hey, we want to make sure that we have all electric cars by 2035. But guess what? You can't plug in your car. Uh, All of these things that the globalist agenda are trying to do, like you need to eat bugs uh, and other things that just go completely against our standards of life and how uh, everyone in America is used to enjoying the fruits of our own labor, which is actually a biblical principle that uh, is intertwined with the idea of American capitalism. So uh, to break this down a little more and from a much more interesting perspective, I'm joined now by the man who's known as the Raw Egg Nationalist. And you may have seen him on Twitter. You may have read some of his books. And he keeps um, a very high profile, but anonymous. So we're not going to put up his picture. Uh, So if you're watching this on Rumble or any of the video streams, that's why. And if it's audio, you know, hey, you get it all. So uh, thanks so much uh, for joining me today. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. It's a pleasure and a privilege. Yeah. So um, so let's go back for people who haven't heard of you, which, um, you know, I, I think a lot of my audience has. Um, where what exactly uh, caused you to get into this kind of uh, the, the raw egg nationalism movement, which I know you didn't start, but um, you really became very prolific on Twitter? Yeah, well, I, I started off like a lot of anonymous uh, accounts as just a lurker. I was lurking around Twitter, following accounts. Uh, accounts that I liked, people like uh, Bronze Age Pervert, for instance, who some of the listeners may know about. Um, he's a big figure in the, on the online right on Twitter. And um, uh, I got behind this raw egg nationalism uh, hashtag that was going around, people knocking back raw eggs. I have a I have an extensive background in sort of health and fitness, uh, professionally and and in an amateur and in an amateur way. So it was um, it was kind of news to my ears. I thought it was something interesting to try. I tried it, and it and it had fantastic results. And uh, I started tweeting, and uh, things have just got crazy since then. I don't I don't really know how I've got to this point, but I have. And um, uh, I'm a bit of a I'm a figurehead really now of of raw egg nationalism and of uh, health and fitness on the on the right more generally. So an egghead, if you will. You, you could know. say, yeah, you could say. <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, so so what is the phenomenon of raw egg nationalism for people who haven't heard about that and think, you know, wait, you're eating raw eggs? I thought that, you know, every um, cookie dough commercial, you know, kind of has that tagline that says don't consume raw eggs. Yeah, no, I think uh, most people, if they think of eating raw eggs, will obviously think of Rocky, of the Rocky films and those famous montages. Um, raw I egg guess nationalism. Um, Beauty and the Beast, have to put that one in there. <laughs> Raw egg nationalism really is about the intersection of health and fitness on the one hand and politics on the other, because uh, if you didn't know, health and fitness and politics are very much intertwined these days. You can't, um, you know, you'd have to have your head in the sand not to not to know that. And health and fitness really has become the province of the right or uh, healthy or should I say healthy living and fitness have been uh have become the province of the right uh, for various reasons. But the raw egg thing in particular, well, raw eggs are the kind of food that our globalist masters absolutely don't want us to eat, along with meat and other forms of animal products. And the thing about raw eggs in particular is that they're they're cheap. They're a cheap superfood, really. That's the best way to think about it. I mean, m- most of what you've been told about raw eggs is is rubbish, really. They're not... There's very little risk of getting salmonella from raw eggs if the eggs are good quality. The cholesterol won't give you a heart attack and kill you, contrary to what your physician might tell you. Um, there are all sorts of there are numerous studies to substantiate the uh, incredible health benefits of uh, egg consumption, and particularly the cholesterol. Um, for instance, there's one study that shows that actually there's a closer there's a closer correlation between consuming cholesterol and muscle gain than there is between consuming protein and muscle gain. So really what we're doing is we're we're turning traditional nutritional advice totally on its head and trying to empower people to be healthy and fit so that we can have a healthy uh, and fit nation. Hmm. Yeah, and, and I think for a lot of people saying that health and fitness has become political, um, they they may either say, oh, wow, that's kind of a new idea to me, or they immediately think of something like the vaccine mandates um, and things where the government is telling you, you are compelled to take this for your own health and you can't decide for yourself uh, what is in your own best interests um, in terms of health and fitness. And, you know, in America, of course, and our constitution provides that we should be the arbiters of what we decide um, is in our own best interest. And that's the entire point of having a government led by we the people and um, having the freedom and liberty and the rights that our founders recognized are given by God, our creator, so that the government preserves and protects our own uh, right to, as the founders described it, pursue happiness, but understand what does that mean to every individual? And that's going to look different um, for different individuals. And of course, you know, diversity and that term is a hallmark. And and I would say it's actually been uh, weaponized by the left. And yet when we look at something like health and fitness, there should be some diversity uh, that individuals have the means and the opportunity and the fundamental protected right to decide for themselves what is in their own best interest when it comes to health and fitness. So you wrote a book that's called The Eggs Benedict Option. And um, some of my listeners may have read this, but what compelled you then to write this book and what's the premise? Well, Really, I, I suppose it's events of the last two years, as you've been, um, as you've already touched upon. The um, events of the past two years have been a profound, uh, have been profoundly radicalizing for a lot of people. I think, I think a lot of people who were, who were um, quite content just to sort of uh, sit back and not take notice, have really sat up and started to take notice now, because it's becoming quite clear that actually the powers that be don't have our best interests at heart, and that includes our. That includes our health, although actually, of course, uh, that's a story that we could that we could push back much farther into the past than just two years. You know, I mean, dietary advice of the last seventy years, I would say, has been largely nonsense and is and is mostly responsible for the awful the awful state that many people find themselves in today in terms of their health. Um, but really, the specific the specific thing that uh, prompted me to write this book is the approaching Great Reset and that is what the book is about specifically is the great reset 
it's everything you need to know but don't know about the Great Reset Plan and in particular how they want to transform the way that we eat because, of course, uh, contrary to what most people might think or, or, or the man on the street might think, the way that the way that societies eat is very, very important and questions like who controls the food supply, who gets to eat what are existential questions that actually decide who is a member of the elite who isn't, who has power, and who doesn't. And the Great Reset plan for food really is to transform society by transforming, among other things, the way that we eat. Uh, and so there's this thing called the planetary health diet, which people won't know about, but which has been developed by one of the partners of the World Economic Forum, a group called the Eat Foundation. Uh, and it's a it's the first ever global diet. So it's actually, they've actually got together groups of researchers and scientists and supposed experts, and they've come up with a global diet that everybody will eat in 2050. And uh, the premise of the diet is basically that it has to feed 10 billion people, which will be the world population according to uh, you know, uh, extrapolations in 2050. And it has to, and this world diet also has to has to fit in with all of the climate targets, of course, that um, you know that these groups are advocating, so the Paris Climate Accords and all that kind of stuff. So what you have basically is a global plant-based diet uh, built around um, you know alternative sources of protein, soy, legumes, nuts, insects, uh, lab-grown meat, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, which everybody, which they want everybody to eat by 2050, and of course, um, you know, the notion of dietary choice goes out the window with this. This is something that we're all just going to have to eat to to, to save the planet. Basically, that's their argument. Um, but the thing is that people people don't realise, of course, is that actually these preparations for implementing this kind of stuff are actually very very well advanced. The Eat Foundation, which has created this diet. Uh, is a partner with 30 of the largest um, food producing corporations in the world, uh, including Dan Danone, Unilever, Cargill, people like that. Um, all of these great big corporations are, are totally on board with this agenda. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to raise awareness of what the globalists are actually trying to do. Beyond the simple slogans that we know, you will eat the bugs, you'll live in the pod. I mean, everybody everybody knows those sort of um those sort of slogans, those sort of um, things that people say when they think of the Great Reset. But actually, there is a very specific plan that is being implemented um, to enhance corporate control of the food supply and to change what we eat totally to our detriment. So it's a descriptive, it's a descriptive book. I'm trying to warn people. I'm trying to tell them why this diet uh, will be very bad for them, because it will. So I talk a lot about why plant-based diets in general are very bad for you, uh, the kind of things that you'll miss out on if you eat them, um, the kind of effects that they have. You know, we see these horror stories about vegan children, for instance, who are terribly malnourished and their parents end up you know, going to prison or even worse, the children end up dying uh, occasionally. We hear more and more about that. But the book also, instead of just, or, or isn't just a uh, isn't just a descriptive book. So I'm not trying to uh, depress anybody by telling them, you know, just all the awful things that the globalists are trying to do. I also set out a, a counter plan, a counter great reset, if you will, actually, because I, I think that the globalists are right, at least in one respect, which is that now actually is a good time for us to think about fundamental change to the way that we live. So the counter great reset that I set out is the eggs Benedict option. And it's, it revolves around small-scale farming, a return to uh, small-scale farming by individuals and communities, local food systems, like in Russia, for instance. This is so the, there's a big um, a big comparison with how food is produced in Russia. A system called Russian household gardening, which involves ordinary people producing a very large proportion of the food that they eat. And then I talk about regenerative agriculture on a wider scale. So people like Joel Salatin who's been on Joe Rogan. He advocates for doing farming in a more traditional way without the use of uh, artificial chemicals, pesticides, GMO, all that kind of, um, all that garbage. 
and then I make the case that actually a return to a return to small scale farming could be the basis then for a renewed form of populism. So I talk about the history of the populist movement in the U.S. Uh, because it was a movement of small scale farmers in the in the late nineteenth century against the big interests like the railroads, the corporations, the banks. Um, so that's it. So that's the plan: is is to return to return to local small scale production to producing the foods that we need to eat to flourish, animal foods in particular, nutrient dense animal foods, as a way of fighting the globalist plan with a new a new nationalism, a new form of localism. Hmm. And this is all really fascinating. And obviously, you can see how the left has taken this term health and saying that this is in your best interests. And they're doing fundamentally the exact opposite. This isn't about health. It's all about control. But they like to uh, use and target these terms and say, this is in your best interests. And it's a humanitarian thing. We're saving, you know, it's, a, it's an um, ecosystem thing. We're saving the planet at our own detriment. Um, so when you talk about the option of small scale farming, um, I, I know a lot of people listening to this would say, well, you know, how would I do this if I live, for example, in an apartment or, um, you know, how how small scale would be sustainable enough that an individual would be able to accomplish this? Well, the, the very interesting thing about the Russian example is that Russia is predominantly now an, in, uh, an urban society, too. Um, but the vast majority of people in Russia, whether urban or rural, have these garden plots out in the countryside that they go to during the week and the weekend and they grow fresh fruit and, and vegetables and maybe they keep some chickens. It's something that, you know, that, that tens of millions of Russians do. I think the average, they average 17 hours a week doing it, which is half the time an average American spends in front of the television, according to certain statistics. So it's not like it's a massive time sink or anything like that. Certainly not compared to, um, you know, sitting on the on the sofa watching Netflix, but um, I, I I wouldn't deny that it would require it would definitely require some significant changes to people's lives, and it might require, for instance, the government to start putting aside land for people to use, for instance, for urbanites to use outside the cities. I mean, the U.S. government has done things like that before, for instance, with the Homestead Acts in the 19th century. You know, it's not it's not beyond the realms of possibility for a U.S. government to start giving people land to farm, for instance. You wouldn't. And, and actually, the thing about the Russian case, too, is that these people aren't using huge plots of land either. They're using very small plots of land. But what they're doing is using them in a very productive way. So they're they're using all sorts of techniques, farming techniques like companion planting, where you plant um, different species of plant that are um, they they work well together basically. So you know you can put them together and and they grow well. Um, it's not well. Here's here's a fact: uh, the total area of lawns in the U.S. the total area of private lawns in the U.S. is something like twice the size of the area of land that is under cultivation for household gardening in Russia. So it's like mm. you know, you've al you've already got enough lawn space to start growing um, to start growing uh, probably more than enough food to you know to make a real dent in the in the way that people eat. Um, of course, you'd have to change some local regulations, I think, because I know that in certain places in the US, you're not even allowed to grow food in your own garden. Which is absurd. Yeah. And you know, property rights have been so obfuscated by government zoning regulations and other things. Um, but what about the seeds for these plants? Because, you know, when you're talking about GMO mm. um, and some of these other uh, genetically modified plants, um, a lot of the things that we get from the store, for example, um, are things where even if you have a seed from a fruit and you planted it, it wouldn't necessarily grow. So are, is there still an ability um, to get seeds for this purpose? Yes, there is. This is, a, this is a very, very interesting topic, Jenna. This is something that I talk about actually at length in the book because one of the things, well, the, the principal theme of the Great Reset, according to the World Economic Forum, is corporate control. They call it stakeholder capitalism. But basically what it amounts to is just increased corporate control of everything and one way that you increase corporate control of agriculture is you produce genetically modified versions of plants like monsanto does for instance and then 
you're able to control those seeds as intellectual property. So if you buy genetically modified seeds from Monsanto, for instance, you have to sign you, know, you have to sign a contract that defines every single thing you can and can't do with those seeds. For instance, you can't keep any seeds left over at the end of the year to use the next year. You can't give your seeds to anybody else. You have to go back to Monsanto to get more seeds the next season. And there's this, uh, Monsanto has this basically police force, which is often referred to as the Monsanto Mafia. Uh, there was a Vanity Fair article about it a few years ago. And they, they, they have these private investigators who go around filming farmers and sort of basically blackmailing them and strong arming them to make sure that they're not that they're not in any way infringing Monsanto's intellectual property rights, whatever they are, you know, patent rights as the originator of the seeds. And what these corporations are trying to do, I mean, they've already got a stranglehold on the global seed market, but what they're trying to do is they're trying to make that a total, total form of control where it will be impossible basically to buy any kind of seed that isn't in some, in some way owned by a corporation. So although at the moment, yes, you can still get heirloom seeds, you can still get seeds that um, you know w- will produce plants that are then fertile and will produce their own seeds. The globalists really don't like that, and that's one way that they are trying to um, solidify their control of the agricultural um, market. Yes, is to create seeds that um, that they control totally. Hmm. So, what um, along those lines? Because I think that's a, a fascinating discussion, just in terms of how they're trying to control. Uh, agriculture through intellectual property rights and saying that somehow you're infringing on uh, on the property of someone else when you're when you're using seeds like that. Um, do they have a plan for heirloom seeds or, for example, if someone was growing their garden? I mean, is there a projection that in the future, uh, you know, like the the weaponizing of 87,000 new IRS agents that somehow we're going to have the agriculture police as a part of government coming in and saying, OK, we have to do test samples on what you're growing to make sure that, um, you know, this isn't going against um some corporate interest and you know obviously there there should be a difference between what Monsanto could do in a civil context versus what the government can enforce but this seems to be like a slippery slope and if the government is truly trying to weaponize agriculture and I think that it is then you could see how easily that would become a form of policing I th- I think it's entirely possible I w- I won't make any predictions because I don't think that um any of us really know what's going to happen next apart from that it's probably going to be quite bad i mean the 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 general outlook at the moment does seem to be does seem to be pretty grim what with the inflation supply chain problems war in ukraine all of these other things all of which i think are being used by the globalists to further their aim of of um corporate control of destroying destroying the little man destroying uh the middle classes gutting small businesses um, which already has taken place to a large extent during the coronavirus pandemic. I mean, what we ha- I think we have to see the coronavirus pandemic and what's happening at the moment as being continuous. I don't think that there's any necessarily any separation between them. But um, on the subject of of policing on a on a sort of local scale, then there was a very interesting article actually that was published. It was an opinion piece that was published the other day, I think, in the New York Times, and I talk about it actually in the book. And the article's called, You Want to Eat Meat in This Economy? And uh, it's about how basically inflation is a, is a positive weapon that should be used by the regime to stop people from eating meat. But buried in, the, buried in this opinion piece, then there's a little, there's a paragraph where the author talks about the Lever Act, which is a little known act that was used in 1917 by the government when the US entered the First World War to requisition food supplies from ordinary people. Now, that's uh, that's an interesting precedent for, for a, I know it's only an opinion piece, but it's an interesting precedent for somebody to bring up that the maybe to stop people from eating meat, what we'll have is the US government invoking its power to requisition food from ordinary people. Uh, you know, this is this is actually something that some people in the US want to happen. And maybe it will happen. Who knows? 
Hmm. And and that gets into a broader conversation about the left's push for socialism and saying that you don't have any property. It's all owned by the government and the government can distribute as the government sees fit. And, you know, as, as we're talking, I'm also thinking about, um, you know, everything with um, centralized banking and how the World Economic Forum and the globalists uh, want to stop people and cancel them from their banks and to say, um, you know, things like having a digital credit score. And, you know, we've talked on this show previously about um, like carbon tax and the whole Green New Deal and how, um, you know, if there were some uh, kind of uh, digital ID that uh, people had a social credit score, then the ability to weaponize that and to say, okay, you, um, for example, can't use your own money and your bank account because um, to purchase, for example, a plane ticket because uh, you've already expended your carbon tax credits for the month or the year, or whatever um, increment of time they prefer. And so something like this um, seems like it's plausible as well in the weaponization of agriculture. And so this is this is just a an extreme from a 30,000 foot view. This is um, an extreme way that they are trying to force their control and their preferred outcome on every single aspect of our way of life. And so this all goes together and it's not compartmentalized into, oh, you know, the Green New Deal is bad or, um, you know, the, the social credit score is bad or, um, you know, critical race theory is bad and, and weaponization of agriculture is bad. Um, you know, all of those things individually are, but this is all part of a bigger initiative from the World Economic Forum. And so um, so I, I don't know if you can speak to this as well, but how would you characterize um, this portion of the weaponization of agriculture as um, as as a facet of the bigger plan and how how big of an issue is this when we're seeing things um, like the cancellation of banks and you know social credit score and all those things I just mentioned and then we're seeing news reports of people um, for example like Bill Gates and also the Chinese government that are buying plots of land um, and massive amounts uh, in America that I would assume are not for the benefit of the American people and for agriculture, um, I see all of these things kind of coming together for one, uh, you know, giant nefarious plan. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I totally agree. I, and, and that's something that I try to emphasize in the book. Fundamentally, you know, you can't just, this isn't just a change to the way that we're going to eat. This is a total change to the way that we're going to live. And the thing is, of course, that if you have a planetary diet, which everybody has to eat, and they've set out calorific, um, you know, they've really gone into fine grain detail about this diet, about the calories you're going to get from fat, about the calories you'll get from protein, carbohydrates, as an, as an ordinary person, there's going to have to be some kind of enforcement mechanism for this, of course, because, you know, how do you ensure that everybody only eats their fair share of food? Well, of course, what you're probably going to have is you're going to have some kind of, well, since the main justification for this is global warming and carbon emissions, you're probably going to have some kind of carbon uh, credit system. And the thing is, again, that people don't realize is that the the infrastructure for this is is well advanced already. I mean, I talk in the book, for instance, the British Labour government in 2007 commissioned a full uh, investigation inquiry into how individual carbon credit an, an individual carbon credit system would work so you know i mean gov governments western governments have been thinking about these kinds of things for quite some time uh, and now for instance we're seeing in scandinavia there are already there are already credit cards in scandinavia that you can buy that set your spending limits not based on your finances but based on a uh, a carbon emission target. And so if you spend, well, they just prevent you from spending too much based on your emissions and you can offset your carbon emissions actively, you know, so through your, you can set up automatic like um, direct payments to offset your carbon emissions when you spend. So the infrastructure, the infrastructure for this, um, uh, you know, to, 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 that will be used to, uh, ensure that people eat properly is, is almost certainly going to be used as well to ensure that people buy the right products, to ensure that they, uh, as you say, a social credit score, to ensure that they behave properly. I mean, I think that we can expect that people's, maybe people's rations of food might even be reduced if they start to behave badly. 
which is the sort of thing that already goes on in China. And I think that, yes, to China, it's to China that we should probably look, I think, uh, scarily for the maybe for the for the future, um, for the future society that the globalists want us to live in. Yeah, and, and it is really scary. And even looking at what happened with some of these credit card companies uh, with the Ukraine and Russia war uh, to foreclose uh, some Russian citizens as if they're responsible for the actions of Putin and that they can say just because you are a Russian uh, citizen or nationalist that um, now you're foreclosed from banking at a certain institution. I mean, all of these things are politicizing uh, everyone's individual freedom and liberty and their own choices and their own way of life. And so um, so the, the other question that I have as well is that, you know, when we're looking at um, all of these corporate interests and the um, the mega corporation takeover and how the World Economic Forum is using all of this, what about the corporations that exist um, solely on, you know, the people that, you know, like my generation that's willing to spend $8 on a latte. I mean, you know, some, some things like that and those big corporate interests, um, how are those companies in your estimation just going along with this or how would other uh, mega corporations that, um, then wouldn't have consumers that come to their establishments, ultimately, would they just shut down or push back on this? Or, um, you know, or we're, are we just talking about some smaller amount of the mega corporations, not everyone that, you know, maybe me or, or some other regular person would think of as a major corporate chain? Oh, I think I don't think that every single corporation is on board with this at all. But but what you definitely see with the World Economic Forum and with its partners like the Eat Foundation is that they have selectively they've courted the really big, the really big mega corporations, as I say, like Unilever, Danone, Cargill, um, Monsanto, Bayer, people like that. So they've got the really big corporations on board. And they've also got a lot of influence with um, the World Economic Forum model has a lot of influence in banking and investment. They use a variety of different methods, I think, to coerce smaller players into playing along. So environmental and social uh, goals, for environmental and social governance rather, is a very, very important thing that is becoming becoming a cudgel really to ensure conformity i think among corporations so it's impossible or it's becoming very very difficult for instance to um to get any kind of investment money to get any kind of loan if you don't go along with uh e the kind of esg way of doing things which involves um offsetting your carbon uh emissions and all sorts of stuff like this in terms that are formulated by the World Economic Forum and by other entities like the World Economic Forum. So they have a variety of different ways of coercing conformity, I think, from corporate interests. N nevertheless, I do think I do think that there probably are still corporations and and businesses that 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 can operate in a in a more honest way. But it's um I do think that at the moment, the advantage does lay with the World Economic Forum and with these big corporations that are advocating the Great Reset. We've got to we've got to find a way, I think, to fight on multiple on multiple levels. And that's something that I talk about in the book. You know, we have an individual fight that we can take part in. We can make ourselves healthier. We can disengage from the corporates, from the, the, the bad corporate system as much as possible. Um, but then what we also need is we also need politicians who are advocating for us in the same way we need politicians to talk openly about the great reset to talk openly about fighting this agenda so um i i, I think that the fight back has to take place on multiple levels yeah, absolutely. And this um, just goes right back into why it's so important um, for every single person in the United States who is eligible to vote to uh, to get out and vote in the midterms and make sure that, you know, this isn't a personality contest. You may your preferred candidate may not have won the primary. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things where um, and it actually frustrates me. I was just talking to my mom the other day about how um, so many people consider themselves um, an, an expert or a, um, a judgment of every single individual politician as if um, if there's one or two things that they disagree on, well, I'm not going to vote for that person. And yet they're then OK with 
the state of what's happening and with someone who's even you know, who's a thousand times worse getting into office um, just because they're unwilling to exercise their constitutionally protected right uh, to go and to participate in government and actually be part of we the people. And so uh, we do need to make sure that we are uh, electing the politicians who care about these things, who are willing uh, to protect the American people, to take up uh, legislation that is um, fundamentally against the World Economic Forum um, and all of their goals. And so um, so I, I do think you're totally right that um, it is a political battle and we need to do our part there. It's an individual battle. We all need to be prepared. And we also need to be part of um, of our churches as well, because church communities have ceded so much ground uh, to the government, whether it's uh, the family and turning over our kids to public education, to government run schools. It's not just public, it's government run, government indoctrination. Um, the traditional family has lost um, its grounding and to say that parents are responsible for their children's education. And then the church has ceded uh, morality and moral authority to the government and the humanitarianism that actually rightly and biblically uh, should be part of the church. And that should not be the responsibility or purpose of the government. So we need to get back ultimately to understanding the role of civil society and the th the three spheres of government uh, that God ordained. You know, the civil government has a legitimate purpose, but it's doing a lot of things in an illegitimate way. Um, the family government and parental responsibility, making sure that we as individual families are protecting the members of our families and then being part of a church community so that maybe, you know, as a collective, um, a church community could get one of these parcels of land and, and be responsible for um, every member of their congregation. I mean, the types of things that um, churches ultimately should uh, should have the welfare of their members um, against some of these outside influences. So there's a lot to unpack here, but um, you know we're running out of time. And, and this conversation, I, I love. I hope you'll come back uh, soon. But also, where can people find uh, your book and also follow you on Twitter and um, you know maybe respond and ask any other questions that they have? Because I know that um, for a lot of people, this is a really fascinating area of conversation. And um, so many people email me daily about concerns with the World Economic Forum. So um, I really appreciate. Okay, your time. so the book. Um, you, if you're in the U.S., you can get the book directly from antelopehillpublishing.com. That's the publisher, Antelope Hill, for uh, for the cheapest price. But you can also get it from Amazon or Barnes & Noble, uh, Book Depository, and other third-party retailers. Uh, if you're outside the US, you can get it from Amazon, uh, whether you're in Canada or the UK or elsewhere in Europe. Um, uh, I have a, I've got a nifty little website now, rawegnationalist.com, uh, which has links to all of my stuff. My Twitter uh, handle is babygravy9, and um, uh, I'm on Instagram as well, but that's not uh, that's not such a serious account. But the best place to go is yeah, go to my website, rawegnationalist.com, or go to my Twitter account, babygravy9. Books are on Amazon. Um, uh, and yeah, ask me any questions. Interact with me, please. I, I love interacting with people and answering their questions and um, helping people to change their lives and uh, hopefully make the nation strong again. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time. And um, I'll be one of those that will have a lot of questions. So hope you'll come back again soon. Thank you so much. I'd love to. Thank you. With inflation, the banking world collapse, and everything that Joe Biden is doing not to protect America, you need to make sure to secure your financial health, especially in retirement. And hey, if you're a millennial like me, that actually is sooner than you think. You need to start now, even if you are a millennial or a Gen Zer, to make sure that your financial health is actually healthy when we get to retirement. And Legacy Precious Metals has a revolutionary new online platform that allows you to invest in gold and silver online in real time. In a few easy steps, you can open an account online, select your metals of choice, and choose to have them stored in a vault or shipped right to your door. You'll have access to a dashboard where you can track your portfolio growth in real time 
anytime. You'll see transparent pricing on each coin and bar, and this puts you in complete control of your money. The platform is free to sign up for. Visit LegacyPMInvestments.com and open your account and see this new investing platform for yourself. Gold hedges against inflation and against a volatile stock market. A truly diversified portfolio isn't just more stocks and bonds, but different asset classes. This brand new platform allows you to make investments in gold and silver, no matter how small or large, with just a few clicks. Visit LegacyPM.com to get started. You can download the free investor's guide and you can also call Legacy PM Investments to talk to a portfolio expert to get expert answers to your uh, to customize your personal portfolio. So visit LegacyPMInvestments.com to get started. Tell them that Jenna sent you. Have you ever picked up a towel set because it felt so soft in the store, but then when you leave and you go to use it, it's not really that absorbent? It's basically a towel that is leaving you out to dry. That's why MyPillow has developed the MyPillow towels, towels that actually work. I know, it's totally mind-blowing. Towels that actually dry you. Their six-piece towel set includes two bath towels, two hand towels, and two washcloths. They come in a variety of colors, I have the sage green and the white. I love them. And right now you can receive a six piece set for only $39.98 with promo code Jenna. That's J-E-N-N-A. So go to MyPillow.com right now and click on the radio listener special. MyPillow products come with a 10 year warranty and have a 60 day money back guarantee. So to receive this amazing offer on the six piece towel set of MyPillow towels, just go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio listener special and enter promo code Jenna, that's J-E-N-N-A, or call 1-800-564-8475. That's MyPillow.com, promo code Jenna.